Commander John Henry Eden was a Royal Navy officer who served during World War II, and the HMS Spearfish was the submarine under his command. Together, Eden and the crew of the Spearfish played a significant role in several key naval battles of the war, earning widespread recognition for their bravery and skill. In this video, we'll take a closer look at their remarkable story, exploring their daring exploits, their triumphs, and their struggles as they fought to defend their country and secure victory in the face of overwhelming odds. Commander John Henry Eden was born on the 23rd of February 1910 in Dominica, then part of the British West Indies. His father worked on the lime, sugarcane, and banana plantations that he owned there. After education in England, Eden applied for and got into Britannia Royal Naval College aged just 13. This was where he wanted to be. In later life, he reflected on his desire to travel and the prestige of the Royal Navy being a draw. A naval career, he surmised, was a good start. It would also be busy, as Eden had a lengthy wartime career. However, when the war was literally moments old, Eden unexpectedly became the first British submarine commander to make contact with the enemy. On the 3rd of September, 1939, Eden was on patrol in command of the HMS Spearfish. The S-Class submarine had been commissioned into the Royal Navy just over three years before and was one of the original 12 S-Class boats. The class was designed as a smaller submarine than other types, to be operated by fewer crew, and intended for patrol in the restrictive waters of the North Sea and the Mediterranean. The first four S-boats were the most compact, and Spearfish was part of the slightly larger second batch of eight, and required a slightly larger crew. From 1941, a third group of 50 were constructed. These were larger still and more heavily armed. Spearfish was just shy of 209 feet in length and capable of 10 knots submerged. She was armed with six forward-facing 21-inch torpedo tubes with 12 torpedoes stowed on board and also carried a 3-inch deck gun and a 0.303-inch Lewis machine gun. Her crew was 39 strong. On the 3rd of September, 1939, Spearfish was off the Norwegian coast to the southwest of Stavanger, where she had been since the 25th of August. The patrol was intended to provide information on German shipping movements for potential targeting. Five of the S-Class submarines of 2nd Flotilla were positioned 12 miles apart, just out of sight of the Norwegian coast. The patrol had been thus far uneventful, unsurprising as the war was yet to begin. Spearfish was moving to a new position along the surface when Eden saw two tracks approaching from the port bow. Confusion ensued. Eden and his crew were not to know that the war had broken out. It was mere moments old. The officers on the bridge were at first confident that what they had spotted were two dolphins, but the tracks continued straight on, passing by close to the bow and leaving a distinctive trail of bubbles. Now convinced of the threat, Spearfish dived and attempted to locate what was concluded to be a German U-boat. Minutes after the attack, the signal arrived. Total Germany. The war had begun. The message time of origin was 11.17 a.m. The tracks were first spotted at 11.21 a.m. What followed was a six-hour knife fight with the U-boat. The struggle ended in stalemate and withdrawal, as after Spearfish was set on a ramming course, her unknown adversary evaded and slipped away. The aggressor was never identified. Eden reflected, I was annoyed at the time. It did appear to me the Germans had got the information through before we had. I felt we had been slow off the mark. Despite their brush with death, the patrol continued. Spearfish returned to harbor and the crew enjoyed 13 days in port before setting off on their next war patrol. The new orders took the submarine to a position between Horns Reef and the Heligoland Bight. The task was difficult, as Eden explained. I'd not been there before, it was confined waters close to Germany, close to their main naval ports. It was a difficult and dangerous patrol. The Admiralty had information the Germans might have put sonic indicator buoys marking their passages through their minefield. Alternatively, the device could have been an anti-submarine weapon. I was to find out which it was. The only thing to do was to sit on the position where this device was reported to be and see what happened.
Spearfish left port on the 20th of September and headed across the North Sea. She sailed on the surface at night and dived by daytime. Three days into the patrol, her position was off the Danish coast, and Spearfish ran into a large fleet of local fishing trawlers. Eager to avoid detection, or worse, becoming tangled in their nets, Eden took his vessel down to 70 feet and passed under the fishermen. It was still risky, as one near accident almost proved. Upon returning to periscope depth, I nearly put my scope through the bottom of a trawler letting down his nets. Estimated range, 25 yards. The danger of detection was high, but it appeared they had got away with the error. Spearfish continued on her hazardous mission. The following day, 24 September, recalled Eden, we dived at 3.46 a.m. Half an hour later, we heard a faint hydrophone effect ahead. The noise indicated propellers. At 7.13 a.m., we heard a large charge. It was a tense moment. The waters were shallow, and not only did this mean that there was very little room to maneuver, but there were no strong currents or variances in water temperature to try to hide behind to disrupt their sonar signature. We bottomed at 84 feet and stopped all machinery. We listened, carefully. At 9 a.m., I decided to go to periscope depth. Nothing had been heard for two hours. I wanted a look. Five minutes later, after the ballast pump had been started, a heavy charge started quite close. This shook the submarine. It did some minor damage. We were being hunted. For hours, those trapped aboard Spearfish endured a heavy bombardment. As they sat, powerless and unable to evade or do anything in reply, the men, including Eden, contemplated their position and pondered how they, despite their care, ended up in such a position. Perhaps they had stumbled across the function of their objective, or had they been spotted off the coast of Denmark and their heading correctly estimated. All they knew was that, so they thought, it should have been far more difficult for German surface vessels to have discovered them. The atmosphere was normal, but we'd been dived for six hours and had been somewhat mystified by the events which had occurred. It was very difficult to work out how far away an explosion is underwater. My orders to the crew were to keep quiet, lie down and rest, to conserve oxygen we had and limit the carbon dioxide that was being exhaled. We kept one watch on, about a dozen people, there was an officer in the control room, an ERA engineer in the control room, two men on the hydroplanes, ratings in the engine room, and in the torpedo space. I was sitting in the war room, listening, receiving any report. We had very little information as we could not use our ASDIC sonar, the water being too shallow. Our hydrophones were not good, and all we could take note of was the sound of explosions. At that time of the war, the feeling was the Germans probably did not have ASDIC or certainly nothing as good as what we had. On the other hand, we knew they had good hydrophones. Sat on the bottom and keeping quiet, we hoped our presence would not be further given away, but depth charges continued to be heard. From 2.50 p.m. to 4.10 p.m., the enemy must have made contact with a strong object. Luckily not us, it must have been a wreck. 25 charges exploded. The next thing we heard was a bump on the outer casing. A charge then exploded with the most appalling crash. These gave us a good thump, but did no damage. Then it seemed Eden's luck had ran out. At 5.20 p.m., some form of wire or grapnel was heard passing over the after-jumping stay, which extends from the stern to the conning tower and is intended to fend off nets or wires underwater. The next thing we heard was a bump on the outer casing. A charge then exploded with the most appalling crash. The whole boat appeared to spring inwards and then open out again. Nearly all the lights were smashed. In the darkness, the squirting of water and hissing of escaping air could be clearly heard. I ordered the crew to proceed quietly to diving stations and switched on the secondary lighting to investigate the damage. I sat still for a moment and rather expected a wall of water to flood up the submarine. However, the reports came in, whilst we were leaking badly, there was no immediate danger of flooding up. The main damage was that the engine room pressure hull and frames had been pushed in and were leaking. The port main motor cooler burst and the port main motor switchboard was covered in water. There were serious high pressure air leaks, the main battery ventilation drain was running water. The crew behaved magnificently, immediately we set about making good. The worst leaking was where the frames in the engine room had parted from the plates. Fortunately, before the patrol we had made ourselves a box of wooden plugs of varying sizes. The fact that we did this followed reading submarine reports from the First World War. 
That we had these plugs and were able to use them was a very important factor in enabling us to limit the damage. Many more charges were heard, some shaking the boat. At 6 p.m. I issued a tot of rum and made the men all lay or sit down. The air was getting foul and several men were breathing heavily. It was close and it affected us all. We had violent headaches, it affected our memory. It became very difficult to think. With little sign of the attack abating and the oxygen running out, a point was coming where a decision would have to be made. The options were not good. Either stay at the bottom and pray the Germans lost contact or thought their target destroyed before those on board Spearfish suffocated or attempt to surface the crippled submarine and fight it out with their aggressor. In either case, the chances were slim. Eden opted for the latter. I gave orders to place the recognition manual, cipher books and war orders under the bilge plate in the machinery space. Then I mustered all hands, congratulated them on their great steadiness, then explained that I intended to blow the ship to the surface at 8.30 p.m. If there was any enemy in sight, we would engage them. If not, we would make our way home. We flooded all torpedo tubes. We provided ammunition for the three-inch deck gun and prepared the Lewis gun. I rigged a demolition charge in case I should be faced with having to blow the submarine up. At 8.45 p.m. all hands were at diving stations and we surfaced. We never thought of surrendering. We had to continue to fight as long as we possibly could. When I told them we were going to fight it out, they all immediately perked up. You could never tell from them, but the odds were heavily against us. Our chances slim. With Spearfish ready to reply in what was very likely to be its last gallant struggle, the battered and crushed submarine breached the surface. It was a nervous moment. As Eden later recalled, the boat faced great difficulty in surfacing. There was a good chance she may have been unable to surface at all. Nevertheless, the air was pumped into the ballast tanks, and with a great lurch, the bottom of the beast lifted and began the short climb to an unknown fate. There was incredible pressure in the submarine on account of the escaping air, and the leading signalman prevented me from being blown through the hatch by holding onto my legs. Two ratings, the two oldest, were unconscious by this time, but they soon recovered. There was no doubt it was the carbon dioxide content in the air. Nothing was in sight. It was a fine, clear night. Visibility was about three miles. The feeling was of great relief. I allowed the men to come up and get a breath of fresh air a few at a time. The Germans were nowhere to be seen. They likely thought their quarry destroyed. They had failed to sink Spearfish, but had succeeded in crippling her. Eden reflected, Because of the damage, there was no question of diving. We couldn't do it. That was certain. We had to make our way home on the surface. Initially, the only means of propulsion was one main motor. I was going toward Danish territorial waters. The situation on the bridge was that the Sperry repeater, navigation lights, main aerials, and all voice pipes had been smashed. At 10.45 p.m., the chief engineer and his engine room staff succeeded in starting and running both main engines. It was a great effort and gave us a much improved chance of finding our way home. We spent Monday working our way up the Danish coast, close to the shore. There were a considerable number of fishing trawlers, and on one occasion a German reconnaissance aircraft passed close. However, we were able to nose in amongst a bunch of Danish trawlers and were not identified. The Danes did not greet us but showed no hostility either. If anything, they must have been puzzled. Good. We did not wish to involve the trawlers, so we did not contact them. Spearfish crawled up the coast towards Norway, sticking as close to sand dunes as Eden dared, and traveling deliberately slowly to avoid being spotted by aircraft. Her only defense was the Lewis gun and two rifles. Despite the danger, the submarine continued on, and with purpose. We managed to get our wireless working so we reported our position and intentions. The home fleet came out to retrieve us, this gave us a great lift. We knew help was coming. We were given a rendezvous to meet two of our destroyers. The British quickly disproved the claim, and the episode became one of embarrassment for the Nazis. Spearfish reached the designated place at 12.43 a.m. on the 26th of September. Just two minutes later, the tribal-class destroyers Matabele and Eskimo arrived. From 7 a.m., other British ships joined the group to escort the stricken sub home. 
We were proceeding homewards in company with the light cruisers HMS Southampton and Aurora, and the destroyers Eskimo, Matabele, and Somali, HMS Mashona, was also part of the escort. At 11 a.m., a German flying boat was sighted to the south. Shortly after, three aircraft from Ark Royal, which also sallied to our aid, proceed pursuit of the float plane. HMS Ark Royal had left port, in company with HMS Hood and HMS Nelson, on the 25th of September, specifically to bring Spearfish home. The group was one part of a large effort involving 25 ships, including four capital vessels, five cruisers, and a host of destroyers. The carrier scrambled three Blackburn skuas to chase off the enemy contact, a trio of Dornier Du-18 seaplanes. One of these aircraft was shot down, earning Ark Royal the accolade of having secured Britain's first air-to-air -air victory of the Second World War. It was the second first in as many weeks for the much-loved carrier, as on the 14th of September she had assisted in the sinking of the U-39, the first U-boat lost in the conflict. Then we sighted British battleships northwest, recalled Eden. Everything started to happen. The tribal-class destroyers were carrying out a depth charge attack on a contact, while enemy bombers were sighted flying at approximately 10,000 feet. They circled up sun, then attacked the cruisers. Southampton disappeared completely in splashes from one salvo of bombs. The German attack struck me as being remarkably well executed and accurate. The strike was conducted by four Junkers Ju 88S of Kampfgeschwader, KG 30. The Luftwaffe bomber wing was trained as an anti shipping and maritime attack unit. Three of the aircraft were driven away by anti aircraft fire, with Southampton sustaining minor damage from near misses and Hood shrugging off a 250 kg bomb, which hit her port torpedo bulge and deflected into the sea, exploding with little damage and some minor flooding. One aircraft made Ark Royal its target before returning home. The 1,000 kg bomb landed just 100 feet off the carrier's starboard bow. German reconnaissance flights later found and observed the rescue fleet, and noted the presence of Hood and Nelson, but importantly, the absence of the Ark Royal. The German propaganda machine claimed the carrier as sunk, when the Ark had actually survived unscathed. The British quickly disproved the claim, and the episode became one of embarrassment for the Nazis. Crawling along at the center of this heavy escort, Spearfish continued on the surface of the North Sea. She reached Rosyth on the Scottish coast at 9.45 a.m. on the 27th of September. The substantial damage to the sub necessitated repairs that took until the 11th of March 1940 to complete. Eden was always confused as to how the Germans had found Spearfish. In later life, he found his answer. I had always been puzzled as to how the Germans gained contact. I had taken extreme care to avoid anything that would give us away. And yet, within hours of reaching my patrol position, they were within contact. On a visit to Fort Blockhouse, I told the curator of the submarine museum, and he informed me that our cipher had been broken by the Germans. They knew exactly where I was going. They simply had been waiting for me, rather like setting a mouse trap and waiting for the mouse. They knew we were proceeded to a certain position, but I don't think they knew our objective. Spearfish sailed on her third war patrol under Lieutenant Commander John Jock Hay Forbes on the 5th of April, 1940. On that sortie, she was attacked by a German bomber and sustained minor damage, in addition to escaping from an enemy destroyer. On the 11th of April, Forbes successfully torpedoed the heavy cruiser Lutzow off the Danish coast, knocking her out of action for a year. The cruiser was sailing back at full speed from Norway following the Battle of Drobach Sound, and Spearfish's torpedoes collapsed the Lutzow's stern and destroyed her steering. Unfortunately, while beginning her sixth war patrol on the 31st of July 1940, Spearfish was spotted on the surface by the U-34 and torpedoed, and 40 men sank with her. Able seaman William Pester was rescued and captured by the Germans. Of the first 12 S-Class submarines, just two survived the war. Nine were lost as a result of enemy action or to friendly fire, with one scuttled as a target. After leaving Spearfish and receiving the DSC for his actions, Eden was given command of the destroyer Venetia, 
then the submarine's utmost and upright. While in temporary command of the Scott-class destroyer leader escort HMS McKay, Eden was mentioned in dispatches for his part in the skillful driving off of deadly German e-boats that threatened an Allied convoy on the 13th of March, 1942. After training new officers, Eden returned to sea in May 1943, commanding the I-class destroyer HMS Inconstant. On the 12th of July the same year, he harried the U-409 in a two-and-a-half-hour action, dropping 46 depth charges and blowing the submarine to the surface. The U-409 came up almost vertically, then slid beneath the waves and again surfaced astern of Inconstant, wildly out of control. Gunfire finally sank the foundering vessel, and Eden then rescued 30 of the submariners. He was awarded the bar to his DSC, and more than 50 years later, the U-409's captain, Hans Ferdinand Massman, wrote to thank him for rescuing him and his surviving crew. January 1944 took in constant to the Arctic, where Eden earned a second bar to his DSC after gathering and escorting some of the remnants of convoy JW-56A, scattered by the weather and harried by a wolf pack of seven U-boats. Five merchant ships turned back and three were sunk, but twelve arrived at Murmansk and Inconstant destroyed the U-314. Immediately afterwards, Eden helped escort the return convoy, JW-56B. The war ended with Eden in command of the frigate HMS Loch Acre. The conflict had been one of courage, endurance, and devotion for the thrice-decorated lieutenant commander, who served in the Royal Navy until 1955, retiring at the rank of commander. He settled in the Lake District in 1969 and adopted mountain walking as a hobby. He died aged 97 in 2007, survived by his second wife, two sons, and two daughters. Thanks for watching. Remember to like and subscribe. See you soon.